Thank you always and share screen. And full screen. Okay, so let us get started. So as I said at the last week, um, so we basically finished the first half of this semester talk, uh, building up the quantum field theory in general and specifically apply quantum field theory to various interesting problems uh, in non relativistic systems. And now we start moving to the second half of the semester where we actually start to making things uh, a relativistic and Lorentz invariant. And in fact, today is the first time where you are going to see a photon in, in QFT. So uh, I mentioned photon as at least my prime motivation and frustration when I, I had when I was studying the quantum mechanics myself back in college. And uh, because photon had been mentioned so many times at the beginning of quantum mechanics class as a motivation why I have to study it. But you don't see photon because you don't uh, quantize the field in quantum mechanics class. And now that we, are, we have this QFT class ongoing, so we are going to see a photon today. So that's the, the, the main subject today. And so you know the Maxwell's equations and you have this Gauss's law and there's no magnetic charge and this uh, uh, magnetic induction and the Ampere's law and so on. So we, we are familiar with all these equations from electromagnetism. One thing you might have not actually thought about this is that this is definitely not a single equation but a set of equations as you of course see uh, clearly. And in this set of equations, there are six unknowns, right? Because you're solving these equations for electric field and magnetic field, each of them are vectors. So each of them have three components, X, Y, and Z. So three components for the electric field, three components in the magnetic field. So all together, you have six unknowns you're solving these equations for. But if you look at the number of equations you have here, there are actually eight equations. First equation is a single component, so one. Second equation is also single component, that's two. And third equation is a equation for the vector, the curl E and the time derivative of the magnetic field. So there are three equations in here. And the last equation also is vector. So it's the three equations uh, as well. So I have one plus one plus three plus three, that's eight equations. So normally you don't think that such set of equations would have any solutions because this is overdetermined. And the, in, electromagnet, in, in the class of electromagnetism, you may not hear about this statement, but if you actually just stare at this set of equations, you see that it's actually very strange, right? You have six unknowns, you have six equations you're supposed to solve. Normally, you don't expect to see any solutions whatsoever when you have this overdetermined set of equations. But of course, you do know that the Maxwell equation would lead to, you know, uh, the, the, the familiar set of our solutions like Coulomb potential, uh, uh, the magnetic field around the electric current, electromagnetic wave and so on. So you do know there are solutions. And the trick is that some of the equations actually, it turned out to be rather trivial. So the minute you re-express the electric field and magnetic field using scalar potential phi and vector potential A, then immediately these middle two equations are trivially satisfied because once B is written as a curl of A, divergence of anything that's curl is zero just because the different components of the derivatives commute with each other. And also if you stick in this expression into uh, uh, the, of the electric field into this curl E, the curl of gradient also identically vanishes so the only thing that remains is the curl A time derivative, which is nothing but magnetic field with time derivative, so they cancel. So this again is trivially satisfied. So these two equations are in modern language is called Bianchi identities. So they are not equations to be solved for. The minute you write electric and magnetic fields using scalar potential and vector potential, they are just zero identically. So they are identities. So you don't need to regard middle two equations to be something you need to solve for. And once you actually realize this, then you have four unknowns because you have a scalar potential, that's one component, vector potential, there's three components, X, Y, and Z, 
So you have four unknowns you are solving these equations for. And in terms of number of equations, you have precisely four. The first one is one equation. And the last one is three equations because this is actually equation among the vectors in space. So one plus three, that's four. So I have four unknowns, I have four equations, and then it's reasonable to expect that you find interesting solutions out of these equations. And that's what we actually do in solving Maxwell's equations. So normally, if you see Maxwell's equations, you are facing eight equations for six unknowns, but using scalar and vector potential, we can make them a manageable, solvable set of equations. You have four unknowns and you have four equations. So it makes sense that you have a good solutions coming out of the Maxwell's equations. And that's one of the reasons why we regard scalar potential and vector potential to be the fundamental degrees of freedom in electromagnetism, not electric field and magnetic fields. So this is actually an important jump. Rather than talking about electric field and magnetic fields being fundamental degrees of freedom, we will be talking about scalar and vector potentials to be the fundamental degrees of freedom in describing electromagnetism. So when we go ahead and quantize it, and of course we are going to get photons out of this, we use the vector potential as the field, not electric field or magnetic field, but we use the vector potential as the fundamental field in the Lagrangian to do the quantization and find creation and annihilation operators out of it. So that's what I wanted to tell you first, when we deal with electromagnetism in general, we would regard scalar and vector potential to be the field of variables in the Lagrangian instead of electric and magnetic fields. And then we go ahead and do the canonical quantization, just like what we have done with the Schrodinger field with respect to scalar and vector potentials, not with respect to electric and magnetic fields. And that makes sense from the counting of degrees of freedom I have just mentioned, using these potentials, you have four equations of four unknowns, and that's a reasonable set of the variables we regard as the fundamental degrees of freedom in the system. So that's what I'm going to do for the rest of the discussions. So any questions about this point? Uh, yeah, Brian? I have a question. Yeah. Go ahead. Yeah, yeah. So usually we can also pick up a gauge. Isn't that a action to impose another like constraint? Right, so I talk about gauge invariance and transformation on the next slide. So uh, hold on to that question okay. for now. Any other questions here? And of course, most of you know already from presumably quantum mechanics class that, uh, that there are things uh, in uh, the phenomena in quantum mechanics where you crucially depend on vector potential, a Harold Bohm effect, even when an electron is moving in space, which doesn't have any magnetic field in it. If there is a vector potential, the presence of the vector potential actually affects the interference pattern of the electron uh, matter waves. So you know already that using electric and magnetic fields cannot be a complete description of electromagnetism anyway. So you have to rely on these potentials uh, no matter what. But nonetheless, this is yet, yet another reason why you need to use potentials as the fundamental degrees of freedom in quantum field theory rather than the electric and magnetic fields. Okay, any further questions on this? Nothing? Okay. So uh, as Ryan was asking already, uh, there is also additional thing called the gauge invariance. We did talk about this already when we uh, start to introduce the quantum field for the Cooper pairs because we have to make sure that the Cooper pairs has electric charge, it couples to the electromagnetism proper way. And the way you make sure the coupling is done properly is making sure that uh, your Lagrangian is gauge invariant. So we have seen this already, but let me just quickly re uh, the refresh your memory on this. So the field strength of electromagnetism E and B are now written in terms of the scalar and vector potential, but there's an ambiguity in choosing scalar and vector potential to reproduce the electric and magnetic fields. Because if you change scalar potential to this new scalar potential, which differs by time derivative of some arbitrary function chi, and correspondingly, you also change the vector potential to a new vector potential, 
uh, related by the gradient of the same arbitrary scale of function chi, then the electric field and magnetic field don't change. So this is an ambiguity in scalar and vector potentials, which do not affect electric and magnetic fields. And in classical mechanics, all you care about is the equations of motion. So for electromagnetic fields, the equation motion is nothing but the Maxwell's equations. They are written in terms of the uh, electric and magnetic fields. Also the equation motion for the point particles, which can be accelerated by the electric field and, and can move, uh, bend due to the Lorentz force from magnetic field. For either case, the equation motion is written in terms of the field strength electric and magnetic fields. So there is no direct dependence on the scalar and vector potentials. So at least in classical mechanics, the, uh, the, the field strength E and B are all you care about. You never care really about phi and A for the purpose of solving equations. So that's why electromagnetism is totally invariant under this gauge transformation because gauge transformation does not change the field strength, neither electric nor magnetic field. So that was the situation in, in classical mechanics you are very familiar with. And again, you have seen this before, but uh, any questions about this statement here? I guess this is more of like a philosophical statement, but you mentioned okay. that um, the potentials are the fundamental degrees of freedom, mm -hmm. yet classical mechanics seems to only depend on the field strengths. So right. I guess why is that so? Yeah, so in some sense, the classical physicists didn't know that the phi and A should be the fundamental degrees of freedom. And now that, of course, you know, because our Harnell form effect tells us A is definitely necessary for the description of the interference for the electron matter waves. So we know that already experimentally, but they were not aware of it because they didn't know quantum mechanics yet. So as far as the classical physics is concerned, in some sense, you can fool yourselves that you should regard electric and magnetic fields to be fundamental degrees of freedom, even though there was a sign of it, namely that you have these uh, uh, six equa uh, eight equations for six uh, unknowns. So, you know, in some sense, there was some signs that the classical description using uh, electric magnetic fields was in some sense incomplete, but that was nothing glaring in your eyes yet. And now, now we do, because of the Hernan-Bohm effect, we know we need to use phi and A instead of E and B. So we had to make a switch uh, confidently now, but it was not totally clear back then. So that's the sort of philosophical point I think you're alluding to, Sahil. Okay, yeah, makes sense. Okay, any further questions here? And in some sense, physicists are a bunch of people who want to argue a lot. So even after the discovery of Harnaboom effect, some people still try to come up with a description of it using field strength alone without relying on the potentials. And, and you know, to some extent people succeeded, but not, not really. So uh, I think it's fair to say that now we know for sure that, that, that we're going for the, the potential is the right way to, to go. And in fact, beyond the electromagnetism, there are many other theories we have now, which rely on similar kind of gauge invariance called non-Navidian gauge theory, which is really needed for the description of weak interactions and strong interactions in particle physics. And there, there's basically no formulation we know that relies only on field strength, but not rely on the potentials. So now in some sense, this is firmly established both experimentally and also theoretically. So using this observation that we have this gauge invariance, but nonetheless, we would like to uh, uh, build a formulation based on phi and A, so we need to figure out how to write down the Lagrangian. And we have written down the Lagrangian for matter fields, namely for the Cooper pairs when we talked about superconductivity, but you have already done the homework problem where you derived London equation starting from this Lagrangian, at least for the static case. So uh, in that homework problem, you focus on this B squared term that depends on the vector potential, obviously and you take the variation of this entire Lagrangian with respect to the vector potential and then wrote down the equation. By doing so, do you obtain that by taking the variation of this entire Lagrangian with respect to scalar potential, then this matter part of the Lagrangian depends on phi only in this term here. So that variation gives you this component 
does nothing but the charge density. So psi dagger psi, as we have talked about already uh, over the last half the semester, is the number density of the Schrodinger field. Number density times 2e for the Cooper pairs is the charge density rho. And by combining the phi variation here and phi variation coming from e squared, that would give you this Gauss's law. And so the divergence of electric field is indeed given by this charge density. So that's one equation you get from this Lagrangian. And the other variation with respect to the vector potential gives you the curl of B because the vector potential has curl over A in it. When you take variation with respect to A, you get the curl of the variation. You do integration by parts to let the curl act on the other B in B squared. That's how you get this curl B. E also have A dot in it. So if you take variation with respect to vector potential, you have time derivative of the variation. Again, you do integration by parts and that gives you E dot from the other E in the second power. So that's the left-hand side of this last equation. Right-hand side of the, the equation here is the variation of the Lagrangian for the matter field where you find A dependence here and there. And that is what gives you this current. So you derive this as well in a homework problem. And eventually you took the condensate of psi so that the current turned out to be proportional to density and the vector potential in that homework problem. But more generally, you need to keep this entire pieces for the current. And that is what goes into this last equation for this Maxwell's equation. So that's how you can reproduce all of the Maxwell's equation in, from this Lagrangian E squared minus B squared, basically. So let me repeat, using this Lagrangian E squared minus B squared, together with this coupling to other fields in the Lagrangian, you recover Gauss's law, where electric field is sourced from the charge density. And the last equation here, which is basically Ampere's law, together with this uh, magnetic induction, so that the curl B minus E dot is given by the electrical current. And now that we regard the scalar and vector potential to be the fundamental degrees of freedom, the middle two equations are just identities. So they are not equations to be solved for, they just automatically arise when you write electric and magnetic fields in terms of the, electric, uh, the, the scalar and vector potentials. So these are just identities. You don't need to obtain them from the Lagrangian. They're just automatically there. So the role of this Lagrangian E squared minus B squared is to reproduce the first and the last equations among the Maxwell's equations. And that indeed what you have done in your homework problem already. So we know the Lagrangian we are supposed to use for the electromagnetism. And now that we have a Lagrangian, we can go ahead and quantize it because you know the rules already. Now that we know what the fundamental degrees of freedom are, namely phi and A, you have the Lagrangian for it. And from this Lagrangian, you can define the canonical momentum for the fundamental degrees of freedom. You set up the canonical quantization condition and then go ahead and build the Hilbert space out of it. So you have gone through this routine already for the Schrodinger field. Now we are trying to apply this to this uh, electromagnetic field. When you do so, there are two complications we need to overcome. And they are not big complications. I hope you know you, you should uh, don't feel antsy and, and anxious about it. We're gonna actually go through this one by one. The small complications are have to do with the fact that there is a gauge invariance, which you have seen on the previous slide. And also that now we have four components of the fields, phi and three A's. So that's something we haven't done before. So we have to go through these issues of facing multiple components of the field, you need to quantize. And you also need to make sure that you use gauge invariance properly. But apart from these uh, small complications, the idea is still the same. You have Lagrangian, you know the, what the degree of freedom is, namely phi and A in this Lagrangian, identifying the canonical conjugate momentum, set up canonical uh, the, the quantization uh, uh, condition, and then use that to set up the creation and annihilation operators to define the Hilbert space of your system. So that part is exactly the same as you have done with the Schrodinger field for non relativistic particles already. Okay, so let me stop here. Uh, I'm sure there are questions.
So are the coordinates um, basically phi and uh, a? Uh, in uh, Lagrangian when we track that's right the right so in but this Lagrangian this is written in terms of e and b but we regard this to be a function of phi and a instead rather than a function of e and b and in fact e contains time derivative for a in it right so that's how you can identify the canonically conjugate momentum to a so that we can set up the uh, canonical commutation relation which comes up on the next slide okay I saw Anna making a move. Oh, yeah. Well, I guess um, I was just wondering if we're also like going to take into account like Lorentz invariants or? That's, that's a very good question. So right now I'm talking about this electromagnetism coupled to non-relativistic particles for now. So the Lagrangian doesn't have a full Lorentz invariance yet. But after finishing up discussions on uh, this combination of non-relativistic particle coupled to electromagnetism, we also try to make sure that the matter part of the theory is also Lorentz invariant. And that's a discussion that comes up later when we introduce Klein-Gordon field for spin zero particles and Dirac fields for spin one half particles. So right now, this is a little bit of a mixed bag so we know that the electromagnetism part of the theory is actually Lorentz invariant, but the matter part is not yet. But the reason I'm doing this is that this is already pretty useful. And as I hope to get to later today, this already allows us to compute something we couldn't do before, namely the emission absorption of photon. And so this is one thing I advertised at the very beginning of the course back in, October, in on August, that in quantum mechanics, there was no way we could talk about phenomena where you can create annihilate particles. Number of particles never changes in quantum mechanics, but we have this phenomenon of emitting a photon, absorbing a photon, where definitely number of particles can change. And this is the first point where we can talk about that. Once you couple the electromagnetism to non-relativistic matter, that's already the position where you can talk about hydrogen atom, it's non-relativistic, and hydrogen atom can be excited or de-excited by absorbing and emitting a photon. So already at this stage, you can talk about new phenomenon we have never talked about so far where the number of particles does change. So that's what we like to do first before trying to make everything fully relativistic and Lorentz invariant. So that's the steps where I'm going to take Thank you for that question. Any further questions at this stage? Okay. So the one thing we do is to first take care of this gauge invariance issue. So because gauge invariance is ambiguity in defining scalar and vector potential, we'll be allowed to pick a, a, a gauge choice of whatever we like to remove that ambiguity. And for the purpose here, the most convenient pick we make is to, to choose the Coulomb gauge. Namely that using this ambiguity in A and phi, without loss of generality, we can always perform a gauge transformation in such a way that it always satisfies this condition, namely divergence of A vanishing. So we stick to this gauge choice for now. So then there's no ambiguity anymore. So we make sure that we always choose vector potential in this particular gauge. And once we do so, then Gauss's law turns out to be very simple. So remember the electric field is written in terms of the grad phi and the, the time derivative of the vector potential. And when you take the divergence of the electric field it contains the divergence of the time derivative of the uh, vector potential, which is nothing but the time derivative of this whole thing uh, in a Coulomb gauge condition. So because the Coulomb gauge condition is supposed to be true at any time slices, its time derivative should also vanish. And therefore in this Gauss's law, the vector potential disappears from the expression. So, the, then this, the only piece that contributes to Gauss's law 
is that the electric field is negative grad phi. So divergence of grad phi is Laplacian of phi. And this is the Laplace equation or Poisson equation that the scalar potential is fixed by the charge density. And this is true at any time slices. So basically that the scalar potential is always given as the Coulomb potential given by the, whatever the charge density you have at that moment. So in the Coulomb gauge, you don't need to regard the scalar potential to be dynamical degrees of freedom anymore. No matter what charge distribution you have, that uniquely fixes the scalar potential instantaneously. So this is in some sense, you can always solve the equation for phi. Phi is not an independent degree of freedom anymore. So the only remaining degrees of freedom we have to consider is really the vector potential. So the idea is that you have now this Lagrangian uh, written as E squared minus B squared up to these uh, the fundamental constants, the, the, the uh, of epsilon and mu. And we regard this Lagrangian to be written in terms of the fundamental degree of freedom, which is the vector potential alone now. And so you rewrite it using vector potential. Phi is now fixed by the charge density, so I'm not gonna write about it. So the only dependence on vector potential I have is that this electric field squared would give you a dot, a dot. Magnetic field squared is the curl A squared. But using the integration by parts, the part of the curl A squared turns out to be actually divergence A, which is now vanishing thanks to the Coulomb gauge condition. So you can rewrite this B squared in this particular form, which is the most convenient form you're going to use. Namely that I have some over three components of A, and for each component, I basically have the gradient for uh, a squared. So this expression looks very similar to the term we had for the Schrodinger field, except that we have three A's instead of single Psi. One big difference though, is unlike the Schrodinger field, is that I have now time derivative squared. We didn't have that for the Schrodinger field. And so this part is new, which is not something similar to Schrodinger field, but this part is already familiar Namely that for every component of the field, you have the grad, uh, the, the gradient of the field squared. So that's the Lagrangian we need to quantize now. But if you actually stare at this Lagrangian, this looks basically something we are familiar with too, namely that of harmonic oscillator. So if you go way back to the beginning of the course, when I reviewed harmonic oscillator, I had this Lagrangian x dot squared my, sorry, p squared minus x squared, right? So this is p squared over 2m or one, one half m x dot squared minus half m omega squared x squared. So this form of the Lagrangian is something which you used to be familiar with from quantum mechanics class, but we instead went for another way of writing the Lagrangian using creation and relation operators. And that's the form we use for the Schrodinger field. So, but we actually used to take use this form of the p squared minus x squared. So we actually are going back to that. So this is the form of the, the Lagrangian we are familiar with actually, uh, starting with the harmonic oscillator. So in some sense, we can just go straight to the mode expansion in the momentum space where I can deal with different momentum modes independently from each other. And for each mode, I have x dot squared minus x squared. So I can take the linear combination of x dot and x as the uh, creation and relation operators. Or in other words, I can write x as a plus a dagger and x dot or p as a minus a dagger. So that's the expression I have over here. So for each momentum mode, which I can separate out because each momentum mode turns out to be totally orthogonal to each other once you perform the spatial integral. And for each momentum mode, I have creation and relation operators. And vector potential is the analog of X in harmonic oscillator. So that is expressed in terms of A plus A dagger, annihilation operator plus uh, 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 creation operator. And A dot 
is the an analog of P going back to harmonic oscillator. So the P is written as A minus A dagger. So that's exactly what I have over here. And using box normalization with a finite size cube of each side being L, so the volume is L cube. And I put also this omega P, which is the frequency, angular frequency of the each photon at the end of the day, it turns out. So for each momentum mode P, the absolute value of P times speed of light is the energy of the photon. And the energy is given in terms of h bar times angular frequency. So that's the omega p I'm using in this expression over here. So using this normalization, it turns out that they end up satisfying the correct, the, uh, the creation relation operator commutation relations. So I anticipated uh, this normalization factor in such a way that this annihilation operator little a and this creation operator a dagger end up satisfying that of the creation addition operators. So we're gonna actually go and verify that on the next slide, but I hope the idea is clear. We have the Lagrangian, which was E squared minus B squared, but now that we regard this Lagrangian to be a written as a function of vector potential as a fundamental degrees of freedom, we write the Lagrangian in terms of vector potential in this particular fashion in the Coulomb gauge. And then this Lagrangian basically looks the same as the Lagrangian of harmonic oscillator, x dot squared minus x squared, so that the x, namely vector potential, should be written as a plus a dagger using creation relation operator. And p should be written as a minus a dagger using creation relation operators. And the only complication here is that I have different momentum modes for the vector potential, so I need to keep track of them. I also have three components of A, I have to keep track of them. And I put in this normalization factor for later convenience so that this definition of an addition and creation operators satisfy the familiar uh, commutation relations. But apart from that, that's the only thing I have done on this slide. So I hope at least conceptually, this is straightforward and makes sense to you. Okay, any questions about this? Uh, could you just explain once again the significance of like the uh, E equal to H bar omega is equal to CP, like the relevance of that uh, to this particular, these yeah. last two equations? Right, so uh, that, that appears when we actually talk about the, uh, the, the this, this difference between basically X and P here. So P, if you remember in harmonic oscillator is of course basically X dot in time derivative comes together with the angular frequency omega of the harmonic oscillator, right? So the relationship between X and P has to do with the factor of angular frequency omega. And that's something you see in this prefactor. So it's a little messy, so maybe not easy to see, but I have one over omega in the prefactor for A, but I have omega P upstairs in the prefactor for A dot. So that's the difference between X and P where you have a power of the angular frequency for the harmonic oscillator and angular frequency omega times this original prefactor will bring omega p from downstairs to upstairs inside this gray root. So that's why I needed to make the dependence on the angular frequency explicit in the normalization factor. And I'm sorry that this is a little messy, but that's all there is basically. And the, uh, so the angular frequency was needed for the purpose of comparing expression for A and A dot because of that reason. And, and we also know that angular frequency times H bar is supposed to be energy, uh, the de Broglie's relationship. And we know what the energy of the photon is, which is given by the speed of light times momentum. So the angular frequency omega P is speed of light times the magnitude of momentum divided by H bar, which is supposed to go in here. So when I write this expression expanded in, in each momentum mode, I know what momentum there is in the box uh, in quantized, uh, so in the unit of uh, 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 two by H bar over L, right? And so for each momentum mode, I know what omega P is by this double E's relationship. Then I know everything in this expression as a function of P, which you sum over P. Does that answer your question, Sahil? Um, yeah, so it's, is it the case then that um, the momentum is equal to 
um, omega times x? Uh, yeah, that's that's in here in the exponent, right? So when I expand mm -hmm. this uh, vector potential in Fourier modes, and mm -hmm. p is basically the Fourier vector uh, times h bar, and that's what we call the wave vector in the Fourier expansion. And yeah. once you specify which mode you're looking at, then uniquely this relationship will tell you what omega p is, and that is omega p you're supposed to use in the prefactor. I see. Okay. okay, so the, basically this expansion is nothing but the free expansion of A and A dot together. Any other questions on this slide? Uh, yeah, uh, I was just wondering if like the choice of um, upper versus lower indices like in the Lagrangian and then in the mode expansion. Yeah, yeah. That so, yeah, that's that's a, 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 a very good question because right now I'm not uh, uh, using the relativistic notation. So, uh, uh, so this AI, I probably should have written as a uh, with a superscript I because that's the, the only thing I'm referring to over here. So uh, let me change this when I actually post this again after the lecture. So I change all of these AIs to have the upper indices instead of lower indices. And now I, I hope would uh, resolve any confusions there may be. Is that okay? Okay, any further questions on this slide? Uh, just, just first, uh, oh, sorry. Okay, Sahil? Oh, just very oh. quickly, where, what happened to the phi when we took uh, e squared. Yeah, uh, so, so it, like it's supposed to be still there. Yeah, so when you take oh. e squared and write it in terms of phi and a, then there's mm -hmm. definitely a piece which is uh, the, 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 the grad phi squared in it. Mm -hmm. But grad phi squared is determined completely by the charge density uh, of the surrounding medium or matter fields or matter particles around it. So it's not mm -hmm. independent uh, the, uh, degree of freedom anymore. And it doesn't depend on A, so I'm just simply not writing it. Oh, okay. okay. And the cross right. term is A times grad phi. But integration by parts give you the divergence of A times phi, and divergence of A vanishes in the Coulomb gauge. So the cross term just disappears. So the only thing I did not write when I switched from this top expression to this middle expression is basically grad phi squared which should mm -hmm. be added over here, but grad phi squared doesn't depend on A, and it's uniquely determined by charge density. So it's not an independent dynamical degree of freedom anymore, and that's why I'm dropping yeah. it. Okay, that makes sense. Yeah, thank you for asking that question. I had another question. Who was it? Uh, it's with me. I, okay. I just got Go ahead. a naive question that uh -huh. I don't quite understand the comparison between the second term of the Lagrangian and the second term of the harmonic oscillator. Because this Lagrangian has like a double J inside, but for harmonic oscillator, you just simply have like X yeah. squared instead of. Good, good. Thank you for asking that question too. So here you have this derivative acting on the field. So it may not look like this is X squared, but the minute you switch to the Fourier modes or momentum modes, then this derivative is nothing but pulling out P from the exponent, right? So for each momentum mode, this derivative is actually a number. So I have P from there, P from over there. So altogether I have P squared. So P squared times X squared is the second term. So what it means is that I have basically X dot squared minus x squared times this derivative, which is just the, this mode wave vector squared as a number. And I'm regarding that number uh, wave vector squared as basically the analog of half m omega squared in harmonic oscillator. So the mm. angular frequency of the harmonic oscillator is this term is omega squared and you take the square root of that. And, and this term here is the P squared. I take square root of it. And that's why I get this P at the end of the day as angular frequency. Oh, okay, I see. I see. Does it make sense? 
Yeah, yeah. Okay. And thank, thank you for asking the question too, because I hope that that would have helped also other, other students too. Okay, any other questions on this slide? Is that okay? Okay, so let me uh, go to the next slide where I just set up the canonical quantization condition. So the idea is that now we regard the vector potential as the fundamental degree of freedom in this field theory. And using the usual rule, we define the canonical conjugate momentum to it. Namely, you take the derivative of the Lagrangian with respect to a dot. And again, I should change this subscript to superscript to make Anai happy. And then if you take the derivative respect to a dot, this thing over here, epsilon naught times a dot is the canonically conjugate momentum. And a factor of a half goes away because when you take derivative, this is square of a dot. So that gives you a factor of two uh, from the derivative. So a canonically conjugate momentum is epsilon naught times a dot. So once you know what the canonical conjugate momentum is for the field, you just write down the usual canonical permutation relation, namely the variable, which is X, and the other conjugate momentum, that's P, is supposed to give you IH bar. But now that this is a field, it comes with a delta function uh, when they, uh, the fields have the same positions. And also that we have three components of A, there's additional chronic delta delta IJ, so they do not commute only when you're talking about the same component of A. So other than that, that this additional complication due to having multiple components of the field, that the step is exactly the same thing as you have done with the Schrodinger field theory. And what I advertised already to you is that using this mode expansion in terms of creation and generation operators, this canonical commutation relation between A and A dot fields is completely equivalent to the standard the uh, commutation relation between creation and annihilation operators, namely that AI of P is an annihilation operator of the photon of momentum P in I direction of space. And AJ dagger of Q is the creation operator of the photon of the momentum Q in J dimensional spatial direction. And they satisfy this standard commutation relation among creation and annihilation operators. So you can go either way. If you use this canonical commutation relation among the fields, and I did not write the other two, namely A's commute, A dot commutes with each other. And, and combination of those three commutation relations would actually lead to this commutation relations among creation and addition operators. Again, I did not write the trivial ones that two A's commute, two A daggers commute. Or if you start with this commutation relation, and then you can go ahead and verify this canonical commutation relation among the fields as well. So this commutation relation among the fields and this commutation relation among the creation and relation operators are equivalent to each other. And, and once you do know that, then you know what to do to build the Hilbert space of the theory of photons now. So again, just to recap, we have this Lagrangian in Coulomb gauge where Lagrangian is now written in terms of the vector potential as the degrees of freedom. Using this Lagrangian, you can identify the conjugate momentum to the uh, vector potential and set up the canon uh, canonical commutation relations for them. And it turns out that canonical commutation relation for uh, the vector potential is in one-to-one -one correspondence to the canonical commutation relation between creation and relation operators as we would expect for the photon creation and relation operators. So that's what we have done over here. And I'm not showing you the detailed calculation why this implies this or vice versa, but it's just straightforward and, and that's something you can do on your own or you can consult the lecture notes, photons of PDF for that purpose. Okay, any questions about that? At least I hope that, that all the steps make sense to you. So Anna? can I, can we, are we considering like, um, I guess the, the vector potential and then it's conjugate momentum, um, 
like as the annihilation and creation operators for like a photon at a particular position or are uh, that's an that's an excellent question. So in a case of Schrodinger field theory, and Anna is completely right, we could we got the field psi of x to be annihilation operator of particle at position x and psi dag of x to be creation operator of a particle at position y. It turns out though that when you actually go to the photon, which is inherently relativistic, it turns out that position of the photon, you can never localize it. And I, I was going to mention this when we get to the, uh, the klein gordon field later on, but it turns out that there is some intrinsic size of a particle with the, uh, uh, the mass M, which is called Compton wavelength. And Compton wavelength is it's given in terms of H bar over mass times C. So for a finite mass particle in a relativistic quantum field theory, there is intrinsic spread of the possession, there is intrinsic uncertainty in the possession of the particle, which has to do with the fact that in relativistic theory, you can constantly create the pair of particles and the antiparticles. So if you think a particle exists at a fixed possession, you can always create a particle antiparticle pair around it. And that actually ends up blurring the possession of the particle. And, and that is given by the Compton wavelength. And we'll come back and talk about this later but the upshot here is that the photon is a massless particle. So Compton wavelength is actually infinite. So photon is inherently spread out in space. You can never really localize it to a point. So there is no well-defined notion of creation operator photon at possession. So this creation operator, uh, the field operator A of X has creation operator and annihilation operator in it. But if you, for example, use this operator to create a photon, you think that position X. But when you take the inner product of another state of position Y, they are not orthogonal to each other, it turns out. And that's something you can explicitly verify by using this expansion, by using creation annihilation operator in momentum space. So meaning of the field is now a little bit blurred compared to the very precise meaning we had for the Schrodinger field as creation annihilation operators of particle at a particular position because of the fact that every particle in relativistic quantum field theory is spread out over Compton wavelength. And of course, when you take the limit of C going to infinity, Compton wavelength H bar over MC goes to zero. So that recovers what we know for the, uh, the, the, the localized particle in non-relativistic limit. But now that we have to keep the speed of light finite, there is finite spread for any particles. And in particular for photon, which is massless, then it's always spread out to some extent. So there is no notion of localized creation annihilation operator, it turns out. So that's something beyond what I wanted to say on this slide. We will come back and talk about this later on. So hopefully that makes, makes sense, better sense uh, later on. But anyway, that's the upshot of what's coming later. Is that okay for now, Anna? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Any further questions? Oh, Professor, quick question. Okay, Andrew. Uh, what is it? On the, for, for the commutation relations for the big A, mm -hmm. on the A dot, uh, should, it, should, it, should it be a J upstairs instead of an I? Ah, uh, thank you so much. That, that should be corrected too, yeah. Okay, so okay, I will yeah, definitely sure. correct just, the slides just... for later posting. Thank you, Andrew. Yeah, for sure. Thank, thank you. Good. It's great to have the class who's so observant to correct all the mistakes I make because I can correct them all. I really appreciate that. Any further questions on this slide? Okay, and the rest you know, basically. So now that you have this, uh, the field written in terms of creation annihilation operators, the only thing you have to care about is this additional complication to this Coulomb gauge condition. So I introduced this creation addition operators which satisfy the standard commutation relation, but I haven't made sure yet that this expression is consistent with the Coulomb gauge. So this is the last step of the complication which we didn't have for the Schrodinger field. 
But once we go through this last step of complication, then we are done with the quantization process basically. And then you can build the usual Fox space of all the photons, one photon state, two photon states and so on. So how do we take care of this Coulomb gauge condition? And similar to my response to Ryan on the previous slide, once you have these momentum modes, the derivatives are just these momentum vectors. So the only thing I have to make sure is that when you take this divergence of A, that would extract P from the exponent, dotted together with AI should vanish. So right now, I have three sets of creation addition operators for X direction, Y direction, Z direction. But those three creation addition operators are not totally independent from each other because once you take divergence of A, that would extract P out of the exponent dotted with this index I. So P I A I should vanish. So for each P, these three annihilation operators should satisfy this linear dependencies. So what we need to do then is that for each momentum, we, we can write this annihilation operator as a linear combination of only two independent combinations. So we used to have three independent of A's, but with this Coulomb gauge condition, only two out of three can be there. So the idea is pretty simple. If you write momentum vector, for example, using this uh, uh, polar coordinates, I have two vectors epsilon, which are orthogonal to P, which you can easily verify. And then I have the annihilation creation operators. Now I have only two of those for each of these, what we call the polarization vectors epsilon, so that creation annihilation operators come with only two sets instead of three sets. And these epsilon vectors are called transverse polarization vectors. And that should sound familiar to you because in classical electromagnetism, electromagnetic wave or light comes with two polarization states. If you use the linear polarization, it's either X or Y plane when the wave is propagating through Z direction, or you can have two circular polarizations, one clockwise and another one anti-clockwise. So we know from classical electromagnetism that there are only two independent polarizations for the electromagnetic wave and same is here too. So instead of having three independent sets of creation and addition operators, we have only two independent sets by making sure that both of them are proportional to the momentum vector to satisfy the Coulomb gauge condition. So that's the only additional complication we have to go through before we can build the standard Fox space for photons, just like what we did for the Schrodinger field. Anyway, any questions about this? Um, is it so the case that we have to have everything defined in terms of just two um, operator uh, not, or creation, op I guess, yeah, annihilation operators is mm -hmm. so we, we can only have two orthogonal directions since we're in three dimensional space, right? That's right, right. So, so once you specify P, then you yeah. have a plane that's transverse or orthogonal or perpendicular to P. Then on this plane, you can define two independent vectors for that. And they are given in terms of this epsilon one and epsilon two. And what vectors you choose, of course, is your arbitrary choice, but there's only two basis vectors, no matter what. That you can take different basis vectors, but they're only related by your linear combinations of them. I see, yeah, that makes sense. Okay. And that's something you're familiar with. When you have electromagnetic wave going in Z direction, that's the case when this theta is zero, then the transverse plane is the XY plane and the polarization you can have for the electric magnetic field is either in X direction or Y direction. So that's something you know from classical electromagnetism. And then you are seeing the same thing for the quantum electromagnetism now. Okay, any further questions on this slide? Okay, so now we have to then limit my expression for the vector potential, not for all three independent 
creation addition operators, but limit them to only two of those. And that is done in this expression over here. So for each momentum mode P in this Fourier expansion of vector potential, I have only two choices of an addition operator, parameter wise lambda, which is either one or two, which is just the two independent vectors on the transverse plane. And you use a, your convention of this basis vector, polarization vectors for each of these polarization planes, lambda. So this is the picture over here. So this direction is the momentum direction. That's a traveling direction. And you have the transverse plane, which is this plane over here. And you choose either of these vectors to be either on this direction or that direction. And that gives you two choices for this polarization vector epsilon. And once you choose this polarization vector epsilon to be in this direction, and that turns out to be the plane of the electric field. And magnetic field turns out to be in this orthogonal direction. So for each choice of lambda, you choose particular polarization vector on the plane that actually turns out to be the plane of the electric field. And electric field together with this propagation direction is what we normally say is the polarization plane of the electromagnetic wave. So that's something I hope that sounds familiar to you. And as you know that if you use actually sunglasses, which has a polarizer in it, then you can really cut down the glare, especially when you go to say skiing or something, then you get this tremendous glare from the surface of the snow. But the minute you put on this polarized sunglasses, the glare is almost completely gone. And that's because the reflection of light coming from the surface of ocean or uh, uh, of, of, of the, or, or the snow is, is typically polarized in the plane in the horizontal direction. And if you put the polarizer, which shoots only the light wave getting through when the polarization in the, in the vertical direction, then all of the glare coming from the reflection from snow or water uh, is almost completely cut down. So that's something you can experience uh, very easily that this polarization is indeed a degree of freedom for electromagnetic wave. And indeed you have two of those and uh, uh, another thing you can play with, if you, if you buy a piece of polarizer, which you can buy on online, if you put that in front of, uh, for example, laptop screen, the uh, light coming from the laptop screen is also polarized. If you rotate it, then uh, with the orient particular orientation, you don't see anything. So that's something you can uh, uh, have fun playing with the polarizer. So anyway, so that's the thing that actually shows up in this expression. So your vector potential is now expressed in terms of creation and addition operator for each momentum, which means the propagation direction. But for a given propagation direction, you can have two different polarization planes, which is given by the choice of this parameter lambda, which is either one or two. So that gives you what is called the planar polarizations. Okay, any questions about this? So this is the form of the vector potential written in terms of creation addition operators we are going to actually use for practical calculations. Um, so okay? what's okay. the purpose of the superscript of I in this case? Yeah, uh, so, so the like epsilon has this, uh, epsilon is a vector, right? So mm -hmm. if you're looking at the vector potential in X direction, then you are supposed to pick X component of this epsilon vector. If you choose y direction, you're supposed to pick y component of this epsilon vectors and also for the z component. Oh, okay. Is that okay? So if I had written this a vector expressed in terms of epsilon vector, that could have actually uh, maybe served the purpose, but there's so many, many vectors in here. So I wanted to avoid the clutter to confuse what is you know vector in what direction and so on and so forth. So that's why I actually use this superscript I instead, but it is really meant to be this vector potential A is given in terms of this polarization vector epsilons. Okay, Sahil? Yeah. yeah. Okay, any further questions here? 
All right. And if you have pol planar polarizations, and I'm sorry, again, I should have changed this uh, title here. You can also have a circular polarization, which is given by this picture. And, and that's given by this linear combination of the, ve the, uh, uh, of the polarization vectors. So there's an I in here, which is actually important uh, so that you can actually start to rotating this uh, the electric field as the light propagates in this direction. So that's why we're talking about clockwise or anti-clockwise circular polarization. And correspondingly, I can also take linear combination of two sets of annihilation creation operators to define annihilation creation operators for circular polarizations instead. So instead of summing lambda over one or two, you can also sum over lambda with plus or minus. And the same here also for a dot. And that's just a different choice of the basis vectors because they are just linear combinations of each other. You can choose to write the vector potential in terms of creation annihilation operators in the planar polarizations. That's what I did on a previous slide using these epsilon vectors. Or I can write vector potential in terms of creation annihilation operators using these polarization vectors, which corresponds to annihilation creation operators for circular polarizations. And, and they are meant to be same physics, it's just a different choice of bases. So it's sort of similar to what you do in spin in, in quantum mechanics, you can choose spin up and down along the z-axis, but when you choose a different basis or along the y-axis, then your spin state is now re-expressed in terms of spin up plus i times spin down, or spin up minus i times spin down, if you choose the quantization axis to be along the y-axis. So it's just a different choice of basis but in this case, the different choice of basis turns out to be the choice between planar polarization or circular polarization. And, and you're welcome to use each basis you like, depending on the nature of the problem you would work on. Okay, any questions on this? Uh, when Sakyo? we do have the polarization, lambda can be any two orthogonal vectors within that uh, transverse subspace, right? So would we right. still have a freedom of choice as to which particular two vectors, right? That's absolutely right. So for example, I took a particular combination in choosing the basis vectors in the transverse plane here to be explicit mm -hmm. and concrete, but I could have chosen just the two different sets, which are just two linear combinations, epsilon one, epsilon two, as long as you make sure that two basis vectors are orthonormal to each other. So I can choose this orthonormal basis, this orthonormal basis, that orthonormal basis, and, and that's co completely okay. Okay. Yeah. Right. Any further questions on this slide? Yeah, I just Ryan? have a question to follow up to Sakeo. Is there any like particular interest that we should use orthogonal, I mean, orthogonal basis? Yeah, so if because, you don't choose, oh, go ahead. Yeah, yeah, because oh. I, my point for me, it's just a basic linear algebra. We can choose any like two vectors that are independent, just linear. Independent. Yeah, so if you actually don't use the orthonormal basis for epsilon, and when you actually uh, uh, pick some particular polarization vectors that are not orthonormal with each other, then it turns out that different A in A dagger may not commute. So here I wanna make sure that when you write A in A dagger for a particular polarization, then they satisfy creation narration operator commutation relation for that particular uh, polarization. And they don't mix together with any others. And I realized I didn't write it over here. So I wanna make sure that A1 and A2 dagger would commute for different polarizations. And for that purpose, it's important to keep the spaces vector to be orthonormal to each other. Right? I see. Yeah, I, thank you. Okay, any further questions? Okay. So now that I have defined this expansion of 
the field operator vector potential in terms of creation addition operators, what you're supposed to do is now obvious. So uh, if you, for example, write out the Hamiltonian from this Lagrangian, and as usual, Hamiltonian is defined by PQ dot minus L. If you work out, that's E squared plus B squared up to this normalization factors. And you can stick in expression for A and A dot into the Hamiltonian and find that Hamiltonian is really given in terms of this creation narration operator A dagger A times H bar omega as you would have expected for a harmonic oscillator for each momentum mode P. And uh, of course, if you work at it carefully, there's a zero point energy as well, but you know, we're not paying attention to the zero point in energy for now. And we'll come back and talk about it later, by the way. But anyway, so the Hamiltonian it really does look like it is a collection of individual photon where each photon comes in with a number A dagger A for a particular polarization and particular momentum and number times H bar omega is the energy of the collection of the photons. And that's given by this expression as we uh, looked at before. And as a result, we can define the usual vacuum state, which is annihilated by the annihilation operators for every P in each lambda. And then you can create the Fox space by acting the creation operator on this vacuum state to create one photon state two photon states, three photon states, uh, dot, dot, dot. And that's exactly what we have done with the Schrodinger field theory. So the only complication we had to go through, as I said, is first that we are now dealing with the multiple components. And second, there's an issue of fixing the gauge, but we have achieved both of them in this expression. So once you have this expression, you know that this A and A dagger satisfy the standard commutation relation of that of the harmonic oscillator. And therefore you can define the vacuum state in all of those excited states, which correspond to the creation of photons now uh, using this language of quantum field theory. So finally, this is the moment you have seen a photon in your quantum theory using this language of quantum field theory. Any questions? So I should have put in some animation of flying balloons and sparkles and, and the crackers going off and stuff like this. This is a moment to celebrate you're waiting for. Finally, you are seeing how you can deal with photons in quantum physics using this language of quantum field theory. Any questions? Everybody happy? Okay, okay. So now that we have learned how to describe a photon, it's important also then understand how to describe a classical electromagnetic wave because we experience that every day. When you use Wi-Fi, uh, which you are doing probably right now to receive the signal of the internet on your computer, you are receiving a classical electromagnetic radio wave. And how do you describe that? And, and you know the answer probably already because I mentioned already a couple of times, which is nothing but the coherent state. Now we have this creation addition operators of photon. And we know how to create a coherent state using that creation operator which you have seen many times by now. And point here is that once you know how to describe a, a coherent state using this creation addition operator of the photon, you can immediately compute the expectation value of the vector potential using this coherent state. And as you remember, the coherent state is the eigenstate of an addition operator but here I'm using this coherent state for a particular momentum and polarization vector lambda. So all the other annihilation operators in here have zero eigenvalue. They annihilate the ground state or vacuum state. So the only piece that contributes in this big sum over all the momentum modes for the vector potential is this particular mode I created in this coherent state. 
So that's the only piece that contributes to this big sum. And same with the polarization vector. So I used a particular polarization for creating this create, uh, coherent state. So that's the only combination that would contribute. And that is the only operator that would end up having the eigenvalue f. That's the complex number for the coherent state as you have seen already in homework problems. So expectation value of the field operator on this coherent state is immediately given by this eigenvalue f. And here I have chosen a particular direction, namely the momentum is along the z direction. I also chose a particular polarization vector, which is along the x plane. So the only piece that would get expectation value would be x component of the vector potential A. And the momentum is along the z direction. So p dot x is pz. So once you define this coherent state of the photons using creation operator, immediately you find that the vector potential has this expectation value. And of course, this piece F comes from the eigenvalue of A acting on the ket of the coherent state. On the other hand, this F star comes from the creation operator acting on the bra of the coherent state. And that's how you end up with this form of the expectation value. And now you see that this form does have a form of a classical wave propagating in the z direction. And if you don't like this expression, you can rewrite it in terms of cosine and sine. And the phase of f can be absorbed using this trigonometric formula. So this is really a form of a wave, which basically looks like cosine pz over h bar or cosine kz using the wave vector. So this is really a classical wave. And same is true with k dot, uh, sorry, a dot. So this is the way you can obtain the form of the vector potential. And as long as amplitude f is large enough, just like going back to the coherent state of a harmonic oscillator, you can ignore basically the uncertainty in the amplitude and the phase. And then the whole thing starts to behave as if it is really a classical wave. So as long as the amplitude f is large enough, namely that if the coherent state has a large occupation number for the photon, then this is really the description of a classical electromagnetic wave. And the coherent state turns out to be the way of uh, describing it. So whenever you see something like a, a, a classical electromagnetic wave, then think of the coherent state. And now that we have an expression for the vector potential in its time derivative, you can write expression for the electric field, which is nothing but negative a dot, that's given by that, is indeed in x plane. Magnetic field is a curl of it. A has only x direction. So the only way you can get the curl is the z derivative of it. And that is then pointing to y direction, as you would expect. So you do find that this is the plane polarization where E field is pointing in x direction, B field is pointing in y direction, propagating in z direction. So that's the, the way you can describe now a classical electromagnetic wave using the language of photons. And that's the, again, another manifestation of particle wave duality. So you start out with the Lagrangian for the vector potential that is a classical field. You quantized it and you obtain the photon as a particles. But even though now a photon is a particle, you can build the coherent state out of that particle so that you can once again describe a classical electromagnetic field using that language. And hence the photon is both a particle and wave at the same time, particle wave duality, which is manifested in this description over here. So when you, whenever you see this, think of the coherent state, right? And whenever you see radio signal, I uh, think of a coherent state. And it's actually made of the particles, namely photons, but collection of the photons, which is the coherent state, behaves as if it is the classical electromagnetic wave. So you can even say that classical electromagnetic wave, like radio, 
is the both Einstein condensate of photons because it's the same thing, the coherent state. So that's the idea how you uh, go, go, uh, go in full circle. You have a description of Maxwell's equation about classical electromagnetic fields. You have the Lagrangian for it. You quantize it and get the uh, uh, photons out of it. And out of those photons, you go back and then describe the classical electromagnetic field once again. And, and so that's everything turns out to be a full description of the quantum theory of photons now. All right, any questions about this? And I just checked chat. So uh, I, I, it's great to see some, you know, the, the, the wave of uh, a joy uh, uh, of expression that you have now finally seen how to describe a photon in quantum field theory now. Any questions? Okay, so in the remaining only a few minutes I have, I'd like to go through very quickly on how we actually use this description to start talking about actual processes where you can create and annihilate, annihilate a photon. And I will go through the same set of slides again on Friday, so don't uh, fret about going fast about this, but I just would like to give you an upshot on where I'm heading to. So first, we can couple this quantized electromagnetic field to a point particle, like electron inside an atom. And you know the Lagrangian for the point particle coupled to the electromagnetic fields, which you have seen in quantum mechanics class. But now you look at this Hamiltonian with new eyes, namely that A in this Hamiltonian in quantum mechanics class used to be an external classical field for example, when you talk about Landau levels, you're talking about point particle uh, moving in a constant magnetic field given by this vector potential. But now you know this vector potential is actually a field operator. It's not a classical field anymore. And this A now contains creation annihilation operator of the photon. So this Hamiltonian which you have seen before, you didn't know this before, but it can actually create and annihilate a photon now that this vector potential is actually written in terms of creation annihilation operators of photon. So we know the Hamiltonian is what generates a time evolution. Therefore, this describes a time dependent process. So this Hamiltonian, which depends on creation annihilation operator photon, can now describe a process where photon is created or photon disappears as time proceeds. So as an example, I would like to talk about the process of the excitation of atoms like hydrogen atom, where you start with the 2p state of the hydrogen atom over here in 2p state then decays down to the ground state oneness by emitting a photon. And all you need to do is take the Hamiltonian you knew all along. I'm not changing anything here for the point electron. But instead of talking about A as a classical background field, A is now a field operator that can create and annihilate a photon so that this Hamiltonian simultaneously describes a matrix element of transition from 2p state to 1s state at the same time of creating a photon coming from this vector potential as a creation annihilation operator. And that's what we like to do. And what we're going to end up using is the Fermi's golden rule, which I believe you have seen in quantum mechanics class, which you haven't, uh, then please let me know. So all I'm supposed to do is expand the Hamiltonian into the uh, zeroth order piece and the perturbation. And zeroth order piece in our case is the Hamiltonian of the hydrogen atom. So I separate this Hamiltonian into the piece of this electron Hamiltonian in the Coulomb potential. And the perturbation is the piece that depends on the vector potential. So that's this remaining piece over here. And I take the first piece here as H naught. And I define initial and final states 
and in terms of eigenstates of H naught. So that's the two P state, one P state of the hydrogen atom. And transition is caused by the perturbation, which now depends on a vector potential that is capable of creating and annihilating a photon. Then the Fermi's golden rule tells us how to com compute the transition rate, namely how quickly the TP, 2P state would decay down to 1S state by taking the initial state to be 2P of electron, final state to be 1S of electron and one photon in it. So from initial and final state, I have to create one photon to have a non-zero matrix element, but that's done indeed by this vector potential, which contains the creation operator of the photon in it. So now you know everything you need to know to compute how quickly 2s, 2p state would decay into 1s state. Using Fermi's golden rule, you know the wave function for 2p state, you know the wave function for 1s state, you know how A operator can create a photon, and then you can compute this matrix element, and then sum over all final states you have to compute the decay rate of the 2p state. And that's something you didn't know how to do before in quantum mechanics because you didn't know how to change the number of particles in your Hilbert space, but now you do. Now you know how A should be expressed in terms of creation and annihilation operators. You know all the other ingredients you have learned in quantum mechanics. So then you can go ahead and compute how quickly 2p state would decay by emitting a photon and, and that's the something that is now new, which you can do in QFT, but you couldn't do in quantum mechanics. So I stop here for today and see if there are any questions and uh, uh, then the, the, I repeat the same discussions on Friday. Okay, questions? And did we decompose the Hamiltonian into um, you know, the system or the uh, you know, H naught Hamiltonian and the perturbative Hamiltonian? Mm -hmm. uh, simply by expanding the classical like Hamiltonian we have here with, uh, you know, P replaced by P minus E A. That's right. That's right. A. And I would say okay. this is actually quantum Hamiltonian in the sense that P is an operator for the electron. A depends on X and X is an mm -hmm. operator for electron. And mm -hmm. so the P and A in general don't commute actually. So you have to be careful yeah. about the ordering. But it so mm -hmm. happens that in Coulomb gauge, it turns out that they commute as well. So in, in, at the end of the day, you can treat P and A as if they are classical fee, uh, classical objects to expand it out. I see. Oh, sorry, yeah. Would, yeah. yeah, I just meant like the canonical, um, you know, E, e and M Hamiltonian. Sorry, oh. yeah, mm -hmm. that's what I should say. That's right, that's and right, the yeah. The thing that's highlighted in yellow is just, you know, the Hamiltonian for an electron in. Yeah, um, that's the H naught piece. Okay. And the highlighted yeah. in cyan is the delta H piece. Okay, okay, that makes more sense. Hmm? Any other questions? You just said the A, uh, the vector A is the function of the electron, I mean, the electron operators X. So you build A from like electron operators, but it is now a operator or some like photons. So like, like mm -hmm. I mean, can you like explain it intuitively? Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, so I will explain that actually on Friday, but when you actually go ahead and, and compute this, what you're supposed to do is to really stick in this delta H into this matrix element, but delta H includes this vector potential and the X is now the position of the electron and that appears in this exponent over here. So when you compute this matrix element, then I need to keep this X dependence on the position of the electron in computing this matrix element. So that's what I meant. So this X position of the electron is supposed to be an operator of the electron Hilbert space. And I need to keep this in here to compute this matrix element at the end of the day. Does that address your question, Ryan? Uh, kind of, it, it, it's just, um, it seems like like uh, A is the function of X because if you like create a photon, you have to like extract some momentum from the electron. Mm -hmm. So, okay. Yeah, so when, so when you look at this AI, 
which is written in terms of the annihilation operator and creation operator little a, but has this Fourier mode e to the ip x of h bar. And this x here is the x of the electron position. So I need to treat this x as an operator when I com uh, compute this matrix element. Okay, so like the pho photon and electron are not two, are not two independent degrees of freedom, right? In, in no, this they system. are they are independent degree of freedom. But okay, this so. is the uh, the degree of freedom a evaluated at the position of the electron where electron can feel the electromagnetic field. So this x turns out to be the position of the electron. Oh, okay. Which is the operator in this matrix element? Okay, I see. Okay. So, like ph photons are only described by the like the mode expansion. The right, right. And the photon is created where electron is, and that's this x dependence. I see. I see. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions? Um, I guess I just had a general question on the midterm. Okay. Uh, so. In terms of like the Euler Lagrange equations, we've had like various different ways of deriving them or using different forms. Mm -hmm. um, so, is the method that we should use just taking the variation with respect to the coordinate? And in this case, like for one of the homeworks, we had the coordinate being psi dagger, mm -hmm. but uh, would we also treat psi as another coordinate and take the variation with respect to both of them, kind of like what right. we did in the last work with right. phi? Yeah. And Yes, you can you can do that, and you end up getting the same equation except the complex conjugation. Okay, so we only need to do it with respect to one of them. Well, when you take time derivative of the number operator or momentum operator, you have both psi and psi dagger in it. So you want to write down all the Lagrange equations for psi and psi dagger, both of them at the beginning, and then just keep using them for both parts parts one a, a and part b. I see. So you could kind of like solve the Euler Lagrange equation and then substitute that in. Into that's right. That's right. Those mm -hmm. Yep. Oh, okay. that, that's right. I see. Okay. Yeah. I guess what I was finding online was they had like more, they applied like a perturbation to uh, the coordinate and then showed a particular quantity remain conserved under that perturbation. Um, and that's how they showed like certain quantities were conserved, I guess. Okay. Yeah, but for the but, for the midterm yeah, I guess problem, this is like a way more straightforward way. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So midterm problem is very straightforward. You first write down the Lagrange equation, and by taking the variation with respect to psi, variation with respect to psi dagger, you get two equations. Then using mm -hmm. those two equations, you just literally compute the time derivative of the number operator or the momentum operator, and oh, stick okay. that the Lagrange equation in there to show that mm -hmm. it is actually zero up to a surface time. Yeah. Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah, that, that makes a lot more sense. Okay. Any other questions about the lecture or the midterm problems? Okay. So let's adjourn. And uh, I and you are welcome to send me emails about the midterm problems if you have any uh, issues to be clarified. And when that is seems to be a common issue, then I try to share them with the entire class as I have been you, uh, doing. And uh, yeah, so, uh, so uh, don't hesitate to do that. All right, I see you on Friday. Uh, Professor, can I borrow you a few minutes? Like just privately. Okay, let me finish recording.